Now, there's one other aspect uh, of the Reconstruction governments that, of course, got a lot of attention at the time and among historians, and that is political corruption. This was the main argument against Reconstruction, eventually, that these governments were corrupt, they spent too much money, and the reason was black suffrage. In other words, black suffrage created governments that were utterly irresponsible and, uh, you know, travesties, etc., cetera, of, of good government. What is corruption? See, that, that's an interesting question. How do you define corruption? Um, corruption is taking a bribe to do something, a government official taking a bribe. That's pretty clearly corrupt. corrupt. What about taking money from some rich person for your campaign? and promising to do something in office. Is that corruption? That's the way things work now, right? I mean, the Supreme Court has actually been greatly encouraging this by taking away all the um, limits on individual you know, campaign donations. Just a few weeks ago, a whole bunch of aspiring presidential candidates went out to Las Vegas. Why did they go to Las Vegas? Ah, they like a good show, you know, floor show, gambling. No, that's not why they went. They went to literally sit at the feet of Sheldon Edelman, or Edelson, right? Edelman, Edelson, who is a wealthy donor. He's just a rich guy who donates a lot of money to campaigns, and he's got one issue. He didn't care. His issue is he runs casinos, and his issue is stopping online gambling. So all these political figures like Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, a pretty upstanding fellow, and others trekked out there to assure Adelson that they were suddenly, they realized how terrible online gambling was. He had never said a word about it in his life. Suddenly, I mean, Graham, so, and I'm not picking him out. People do this in all uh, areas of politics. And in order to get that guy's money, they have to promise him they're going to take care of the issue that he, that's so important to him. And he puts a lot of money into it. Now, is that corruption? Yeah, I think that's corruption, but uh, it's not really seen that way. Sometimes people see corruption as a kind of Robin Hood operation. In other words, that's the way these political machines operated in the 19th century, the tweed ring in New York and everything. They kind of skimmed off money from businesses they kept a lot for themselves. I'm, you know, Robin Hood didn't put most of it in his pocket. These guys did. But some of it they distributed to uh, poor constituents, uh, people who needed a job, uh, kind of a miniature welfare system created by the political machine, paid for by money skimmed off from you know, building contracts and things like that. Um, so you know, that's another kind of corruption. Um, sometimes corruption plays a positive role in, in getting government to do things. Uh, generally, reformers tend to be middle class who are just outraged by the spectacle of corruption, or business. It's generally businesses who, because they're paying, you know, they're the ones who are paying for this. Uh, if you wanted to import something into New York's harbor, which great harbor in the 19th century, you had to pay the customs collector something. Because there were so many regulations, so many rules, you could always be caught out on some little violation, um, you know, and have to pay a fine. It's much easier to just put some money in the guy's pocket and um, not be bothered by them. But business doesn't like that. So every once in a while, they uh, reform enterprise uh, uh, kicks up to try to get rid of the machines. They do kick out the machines, and then people get fed up with the reformers, and the machines always come back in because the reformers aren't giving out turkeys at Christmas, you know, so why vote for them? So what about the Reconstruction regimes? What is corrupt about them? Well, the main complaint was actually expenditure. They were spending a lot more money than the previous governments for obvious reasons. The size of the citizenry had doubled, basically. The government was doing far more than it had Schools, for example, cost a lot of money to build. If you're not going to have any schools, government can be pretty cheap. How do you pay for these things? Well, through taxation, obviously. So taxes rose. Taxes in Reconstruction were much higher than they had been. And moreover, their incidence fell in different ways. Now taxes were based on property. That's the way it was in the North. Landed property. Uh, remember, I had said before the Civil War, the main tax in the South was not on land. It was on slaves. 
and on kind of licenses and professions. Um, small farmers didn't pay much tax at all, if, even if they owned their own land. Planters didn't pay much on their land either. They paid for their slaves, but they could engross large amounts of land without paying any tax on it. Now you get this general property tax on land, which means a considerable increase for uh, both large and small, mostly white, obviously, landowners. Blacks who don't own property are not paying the property tax. Uh, in, in presidential reconstruction, these governments had tried to finance themselves through poll taxes. What is a poll tax? It, poll tax has nothing to do with voting necessarily. Eventually it will, but a poll tax is a tax on you as an individual. Every person has to pay the poll tax. And the same, the rich guy, the poor guy, it's a way of taxing people who don't have any money. Tax the individual, right? It's totally regressive. The millionaire and the pauper pay the same poll tax. They're very unpopular. It was the poll tax that actually undermined the government of Margaret Thatcher in England in the late 1980s. She was very popular, and then she decided to introduce this poll tax in England where every person in England would pay the same individual tax, and people just thought that was wrong. Uh, so that's how they try to finance it in presidential reconstruction. When radical reconstruction comes in, they get rid of these poll taxes and put in the general property tax, and that is seen as a terrible thing, even though the money was needed by these governments. Well, they also had to borrow money they went into state debt, um, and that's also seen as um, profligacy. Um, but the main source of corruption involved railroad building. The, when, you, when, when these governments decided they could not um, just redistribute property, they took the path that what we got to do is promote economic growth. If we can promote economic growth and economic diversification, then everybody will benefit and poorer people will benefit. They'll have more job opportunities, more choice in what they do. So the way to do that is to get railroad construction, to open up areas, promote factory development. The government starts giving out aid to railroad promoters, factory to try to, but this is done nowadays. I mean, I. I sit there trying to watch the Yankees, and every other inning there's an ad with Governor Cuomo saying, come to New York, set up your business, you don't have to pay any taxes. That's good, but who's paying the taxes then? You know, we are. I'm sure those guys, if the fire, a fire develops, expect a fire company to come and put it out, right? But they're not paying taxes for that. But anyway, you give tax breaks to encourage economic development. This is, so that's what they're doing in Reconstruction, or they give direct aid to businesses. And a lot of these businesses turn out to be corrupt, particularly with railroads. Railroad development is particularly rife with this because you generally only need one railroad between two places. You don't need to build two railroad lines between uh, Columbia and Charleston, for example. So you need one railroad line, and you, so it's, a, it's very lucrative. So these railroad promoters start bribing members of the legislature, bribing members of the government to get the right, to get the charter, so to speak, to build uh, railroads. Many of them are sort of fly-by-night operators because, as I said last time, the real upstanding, you know, prominent business people in the North are investing in railroads in the West. They're investing in mining in the West. They're investing in factories in the West. They're not investing in the South at this period. So it's speculators and marginal people who are, um, who are coming in, uh, taking advantage of some of these governments, etc. Now the worst, I hate to say this for those who are from this state, but the worst corruption was in Louisiana which has a long reputation, it has a reputation for being corrupt. Let me just put it that way. I think more of their governors have ended up in jail than any other state. Uh, Joe Gray Taylor, a Louisianan, born and bred, native of Louisiana, professor at McNeese State in Louisiana, passed away a while ago. In his history of reconstruction in Louisiana, he says, Louisiana state government was corrupt before reconstruction. It was corrupt afterwards. It was corrupt when Republicans were in power. It was corrupt when Democrats were in power. It is always corrupt. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a Louisiana, so don't blame me. Um, and there was plenty of corruption in Louisiana Reconstruction um, in terms of 
skimming off money from public projects and that sort of thing. But it was hardly new. And by the way, many Democrats filled their pockets just like uh, Republicans did. Um, one of the reasons for that, well, there were two basic reasons. One was a lot of money was flowing through the government for the first time, far more than before the war, right? There's a lot of money coming in and a lot of money going out, and there's a tendency for some of that to stick to the fingers of people in power. But maybe even more important, most of the Reconstruction officials, apart from the very top, were very poor people or mo of modest income. And they needed to make a living out of being in office. They could not, uh, once they got out, they, was, they did not have business connections. They often suffered ostracism. For example, Jefferson Long, the first black congressman from Georgia, was a, a free man, a master tailor before the Civil War, and he was making clothing for a lot of white patrons. When he got involved in Reconstruction politics, they all completely stopped patronizing him. His business was destroyed. Black people couldn't support his fancy tailoring business. So in pol he had to make a living in politics. He had to make a living from the, from the salary as a poli p politician, member of Congress, and also gather up as much money as he could, because he knew when you're out of office, you're going to be in big trouble if you have been in, um, in Reconstruction. So all these things. The main point, though, is that, is not to say, as some is start, well, there wasn't that much corruption. There was, but corruption was endemic in this period. We will see next time the Grant administration in uh, Washington was rife with corruption. The Tweed Ring in New York. I'm a New York patriot. We are better, we are superior. We have better and more corruption. The Tweed Ring was stealing a lot more money than anything in the South. We were number one. So, <laughs> My main point is, it was not black suffrage that was the cause of corruption. It is not to say there was no corruption, but the explanation that you had to get rid of Reconstruction in order to stop corruption was not a logical argument. But let me just finish with one little episode of, of corruption that I um, noticed when I was doing my research a long time ago. This was a letter by John Bryant, a... Um, carpetbagger from the north who became uh, superintendent of education in Georgia. And he writes, um, uh, he says in this letter to someone in the north, you know, Republican leaders, he said, are not situated in the south as they are in the north. In the north, a Republican leader may successfully engage in any business. It does not injure the business of the lawyer, the merchant, the manufacturer, the laborer to take an active part in the Republican Party. In the South, it is the opposite. Therefore, the men who do the most for the Republican Party must be assisted by the government. Now, Brian showed initiative in doing this. As his papers revealed in 1868, he took a $3,000 bribe, basically, from Harper and Rowe publishers up here in New York City. Why? Why did they give him $3,000? Well, he writes to them, we shall labor especially to establish a system of common schools in the state. I will labor to that end, and the advantage to your house must be very great. In other words, we're going to use your textbooks, Harper, in our new public school system. So, you know, give me a little bit of money here and we will... Now, why do I mention this? Harper and Rowe is the publisher of my book on Reconstruction. <laughs> now, it's a long time ago, but I put it in there just to see if anyone would complain. Um, they didn't. In fact, the week after I turned in the manuscript for this book, the publishing house was bought by a famous newspaper magnate, Rupert Murdoch. And I think he kind of liked this aspect of my history, given the way he's operated elsewhere. So um, anyway, uh, so that the, but the biggest problem facing these governments, as it will turn out, is violence. The, the necessity to deal with what can only be called terrorism, homegrown American terrorism. Next time, we will look at what happened with that, how they did or didn't, and how Reconstruction begins to, uh, to fade. So, see you then.